So uh, welcome again, everyone, to our Wednesday morning Grand Rounds. Uh, just as a reminder, if you're um, not speaking, asking a question, please uh, just keep yourself on mute. And then, um, like I was saying earlier, all of our sessions are recorded and uh, we will be posting them. So um, if you want to rewatch anything that we've um, previously done uh, that is online and available. Uh, and to introduce our speaker today, um, we'll have uh, Dr. Feely give a brief introduction. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I'm really happy to reintroduce Dr. Edwards to the UCSF Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, Sarah originally gave us a talk about four or five years ago when she joined the VA on complicated shoulder cases. And over the last five years, she's been working with the residents and some of us over at the VA um, and she's universally been ap applauded by the residents as an outstanding teacher, which makes sense because she had won awards essentially at every level for her teaching abilities. Um, last spring, right before COVID, we were able to convince her to come over and join the UCSF Sports Medicine Group. And um, we're really happy to have her. Um, she adds expertise in shoulder and elbow. Uh, she did her fellowship with Bill Levine and others at the um, University of or Columbia University uh, Shoulder and Elbow Fellowship. She was at Northwestern both for residency and as faculty where she was team orthopedic surgeon for the Wildcats. She's taking care of the Cal athletes and she's currently team physician for uh, City College of San Francisco should we return to sports. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Edwards and have her discuss um, injuries to female athletes and the Women's Sports Medicine Center at UCSF. Thank you, Brian. That was a very nice introduction and I'm so happy to be here as well. So I'd like to thank the department for having me speak today as well as um, I felt extremely fortunate to uh, be transitioning in the middle of COVID and getting out of a bad private practice situation. So, so I'm happy to be here, thank you. Everyone laughs at my, my tech. I'm trying to advance the slide and it's not happening. Hang on a second. <laughs> I do have some tech problems and, and they all admit that <laughs> in the department. Um, okay, so getting started. So female, first I'm gonna speak about female athletes. We'll talk about that. Feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions or wanna discuss. And then we'll talk a little bit about the Women's Sports uh, Medicine Center that we are developing here at UCSF. So since 1972, that's when there was the passage of, um, of Title IX. And uh, since that time, the number of female athletes has increased dramatically in the US. And currently, we're at an all-time high for that. Uh, the first woman was admitted to the military academy in 1976. And at that point, there was an increase of overuse injury that was reported in the female cadets. Just when they started to notice that maybe there was something different. Um, a study of West Point uh, the class of 1992 found that women engaging in sports had many more lower extremity injuries than men, particularly stress fractures and patellofemoral pain. And uh, many of the problems that the women athletes face are actually the same ones that occur in men, but some ex occur more exclusively or, or more commonly in women. So we're going we're gonna to touch on those today. Um, when you look at overall injury incidents due to sport, boys, football, boys and men's football has the highest rate of injury overall. But when you look at directly comparable sports uh, like basketball, soccer, baseball, and, and softball, uh, baseball to softball, women have a much higher rate of injury than their male counterparts. Um, boys, also, boys and men also have the highest rate of needing a surgical procedure. But again, when you take football out of the equation, women actually have a much higher rate of injury requiring surgery. So these are some of the diagnoses that are more common to women. And we're gonna to touch on each one. Hopefully each of you can, there's a little bit of something for everyone, even, even the spine people in the, that are watching or um, the, uh, the shoulder people, the foot and ankle people, there's something for everyone. So we um, know that, uh, again, overuse injuries overall. So if you characterize injuries just as overuse, they're much more common in women. Uh, we don't completely understand why, although there's a lot of potential explanations, such as hormonal variation, uh, overall muscle mass related to the body weight is lower in women, so muscle has a protective effect against these injuries. Um, there's differences in ligament and tendon composition in women compared to men. 
Um, there could be a role of nutrition and eating habits and the role of menses and menarche. And again, there's, there's limited correlative data, so there's a lot of room for advancement and research in this field. So just starting with the spine, we know that spondylolysis is found in about 6% of the population. Um, there's an increased prevalence with activities of hyperlordosis, so gymnastics, diving, and dance are the sports that you're most frequently going to see this in. The progression onto spondylolisthesis is also known to be much higher in female athletes. Um, stress fractures are also extremely common in, in women athletes. So, um, and again, this is a femoral neck stress fracture on the compression side. Um, these are something you don't want to miss. Obviously, uh, athletes will complain of pain, difficulty when, when bearing weight and, and running and um, you know, I have a very short fuse to order an MRI on this patient to, to examine. Obviously, this one, you can see it on the x-ray. You don't need it. Um, these are typically, again, due to overuse um, and often in a, an amenorrheic athlete. We're going to talk about uh, the amenorrhea coming up. ACL is kind of the hot thing that we, that us in sports, get excited about, you know, with, with all the women. So, because it is so much higher in women. And um, there's a high incidence of injury, particularly in soccer, basketball, gymnastics. And it's reported to have an incidence of about two to eight times higher than their male counterparts. And they have a higher proportion of non-contact ACLs as well. And there's a lot of interest in why this occurs. So uh, there's essentially intrinsic factors, which we'll go through into extrinsic factors in these women. Um, knee laxity is one of the intrinsic factors that's been shown to correlate with increased risk of ACL. So we know that women, you know, have increased laxity in their bodies compared to men. Some of that's due to estrogen. Some of that's due to underlying uh, collagen um, uh, arrangement. But when you combine that laxity, particularly with other confounding variables, you know, if you have a, a narrow notch in that patient, they're 17 times higher to have an ACL risk. If they have underlying ligamentous laxity and co combined with a higher BMI um, over one standard deviation, they have almost a 40 times higher risk of getting an ACL. So all these things matter. Um, again, looking at intrinsic factors in women. So women have a narrower notch in the femur. So the home where the ACL lives is actually smaller. So there's thought to be some shear force that occurs. They also just have statistically smaller ACLs. So when you have a smaller ACL, the strength of the ligament isn't as strong. We know that from all of our hamstring work. There's a lot of interest in getting the diameter of that ACL up. So women in general are uh, born with a smaller ACL or develop a smaller ACL over time. So it can theoretically uh, sustain less force prior to rupture. There's also hormonal variation. Um, it's noted that the ACL actually has receptors for estrogen, progesterone, and relaxin. The receptors have all been identified on, on the female ACL. Um, it's interesting, some of the newest literature looking at hormonal variation has shown that you know, estrogen actually can enhance tendon collagen synthesis, but it also can decrease cross-linking in ligaments. So, so estrogen in the body can make that ligament more susceptible to rupture. It's also interesting, um, some of the data, just looking at overuse injuries, women have been shown to have decreased tendon collagen synthesis at rest um, and after exercise. So when men exercise, their tendon collagen levels go up and that does not happen in women. So theoretically, there could be more fatigue injuries and it's actually the opposite in muscle. So, so when people work out, they, they actually show a bump in both men and women. So that does not happen uh, to to women in their muscles, but in the ligaments it does. There's also uh, somewhat conflicting data on hormonal variation related to ACLs, but one of the most famous studies looked at, um, they were followed a bunch of NC2A athletes and they looked at when their ACLs occurred within their menstrual cycle. So in these first two weeks, there's a spike of estrogen around day 14, and then the estrogen levels drop significantly. And that's when they found this cluster of ACLs is, is during that time. And there's a conflicting study that also looked at this and they found those women, at least at the elite NC2A level, had ACL injuries around the time of, of menses as well as, or right before when the estrogen levels were at the lowest. So, so it's a little confusing still um, and we're not sure. As far as extrinsic factors are concerned, a study at West Point found that 60% of non-contact ACLs occurred 
with intramural sports versus varsity sports. And again, indicating that that level of conditioning is important. We're starting to see that as these uh, college players and NFL players come back right now. A lot of them are suffering injuries um, at a much higher rate, which is interesting. It was predicted and now it's happening. So it's interesting to watch and probably because they didn't have their extensive training camp due to COVID. Um, from a biomechanical uh, perspective, you know, when they say that women, women kind of do run like girls, we do run like girls a little bit. Um, we are known to have uh, smaller knee flexion angles, increased valgus angles, increased quad muscle activation, decreased hamstring muscle activation during running and cutting compared to male counterparts. And all of those factors has been shown to increase strain on the ACL. And that can be trained. So a lot of the prevention and training programs are working on training young women to, to land appropriately um, to try to, to stop that. Um, also other extrinsic factors, there's the body mass index. So women have a higher BMI, um, with a higher BMI, have a higher incidence of non-contact ACL injury, which makes sense, there's more force. And then um, again, something that's really in, uh, an interest of mine, I know, I know it is in this department because Nirav and Drew and, and uh, Brian have done so much work on this overtraining aspect and professionalization of youth sports in the United States. So clearly there's a, an issue with overtraining. When I was in Chicago, we did a study and we, we looked at, um, you know, I, again, I, I was kind of focused on the single sport athlete. I thought I was trying to prove and do, I did a big study looking at all the high schools around a survey and I was convinced, you know, if they had a single sport issue, they were going to be more likely to be injured. But what I really found, it was the number of exposures. And so it was the kids um, that were overtraining that were had a much higher risk of having an injury um, and needing some type of surgery done. And so uh, I, you know, in my study, we found that having one day off um, versus two day off, two days off a week, you were 80% more likely to have an injury than if you, you know, had the two days off. So, so there's clearly a link between overtraining and fatigue and these kids aren't getting enough uh, rest time. Um, from surgical considerations to the ACL, so the newer data out there shows that women are more likely to have a re-tear of their ACL graft after surgery. Hamstring grafts um, have been shown in one study to have a higher risk of that re-tear, so about 18% in that age from 15 to 20, which is concerning. I'm, I'm a fan of doing hamstring grafts, but I'm doing less of them in that age group because of that of the data. Uh, BTB graft had a 6% chance of re-tear in that age group. There's other studies out there that refute that, that claim, so that's not consistent across the board. The problem with the BTB, of course, is that a lot of the young women then will have report kneeling pain, and it can be as high as 12 to 50% um, in patients that do have a BTB graft, so just some considerations to think about. There's also been a push potentially for an augmentation of the graft in the, in the select high-risk population. And some people are even suggesting that maybe we need to augment with an ALL reconstruction at the same time. I have not incorporated that yet in my practice, although I know some people are, particularly for that high-risk um, young uh, female population. Um, I have used that for revisions in that group. So I've added uh, an ALL to those patients. But uh, again, the data is fresh, it's new and, and controversial at that. Um, if I do do an ALL, I'm augmenting it with a, um, an autograft. Uh, I don't typically use um, uh, the, just a tightrope. Some people just put a tightrope in there, but I, I've been augmenting it with actual tissue or an allograft uh, tissue. Um, the other thought is considering graft choice in the female athletes. So quad tendon in early studies has showed a decreased re-rupture rate compared to hamstring autograph. These are, these are new studies, so the long-term data is not there yet, but um, the advantages of the quad tendon over the hamstring and, and patellar tendon is uh, the girth of the tendon is uh, significant. You also have the advantage of decreased morbidity from the harvest site and no kneeling pain um, and potentially an easier rehab uh, than, than the other. Um, again, this shows the cross-sectional area of the graft. So hamstring has an average of a 53 millimeter um, cross-sectional area compared to patellar tendon. And, and I know all the sports people know this, but when you take a patellar tendon, particularly on a young woman, often that graft is, is extremely thin. And so that's worrisome to me. Um, uh, I'm sorry, quad tendon is 62, hamstring is 53. So quad has been shown to have kind of the, the largest cross-sectional area, which is what we want. 
So in summary for the ACL, you know, we know that female patients have a higher rate of ACL injury. There's a higher risk of re-tear. And then there's an extremely high risk of post-traumatic arthritis, known as, as high as 87%. Um, and then the goals, you know, really are prevention and, and helping young women train in a better way and help correct some of those extrinsic uh, biomechanical factors that can be changed by uh, training factors, also limiting their load or load management on the teams. And then again, taking into effect surgical considerations and possibly doing an early augmentation in those patients, which is being adopted by some people. Um, patellofemoral pain also, uh, not as much fun to talk about as the ACL, but it's also extremely common in female athletes. Um, again, there's a lot of intrinsic factors in women that make this more common. They talk about the Q angle um, in women is higher than men. We have increased external tibial torsion, increased antiversion of the femoral neck, and overall limb alignment and the ligamentous laxity makes, makes us more prone to getting this. Um, patellofemoral treatment is still the mainstay is, is conservative. So that's where our physical therapy colleagues and friends come in and, and really save us by uh, training um, really with muscle education. Um, you know, there's a role for taping in that um, and then working on the quad strengthening, particularly focusing on the BMO. And then now there's more focus on the whole chain. So strengthening the core and the glutes as well. Surgical treatment is not uh, terribly likely in these patients, but it is uh, something that we do when they have recurrent lateral instability. And um, it's uh, most likely to benefit those patients. So usually these are treated non-operatively. So shoulder instability, we'll move on to my favorite joint. Um, unfortunately, it's actually pretty low in women. It's actually good. It's one of the few things that's better. So 90% of, of traumatic shoulder instability is actually in men, 10% uh, in women. It's interesting that women, though, when they do have traumatic instability and need surgery, they, they do have a significantly worse post-op outcome. Um, and they tend to have increased apprehension as well as an increased uh, risk of sulca sign. So again, that's probably due to some underlying ligamentous laxity. They have a higher rate of recurrence. Multidirectional instability is more common in women, again, due to the ligamentous laxity. Non-operative treatment is still uh, the mainstay of, of how we take care of these patients. Um, surgical stabilization has extremely mixed results. Women have inferior clinical outcomes uh, with respect to their final, when you, you do ASCS testing on them. Uh, women also have a higher rate of needing a rotator interval closure because again, they have a persistent sulca sign and inferior instability. Swimmer shoulder also uh, more common in women. Um, and this, this is a great study looking at uh, 3,700 collegiate athletes. So Kaiser did this study and they found, again, statistically significant gender differences in swimming and water polo. So women were much more, more likely to complain of um, anterior shoulder pain as well as overall swimmer's shoulder. Um, and again, I think there's a real need and, and potential for developing programs. It's kind of neglected, you know, everyone, there's a lot of ACL prevention out there, but and a lot of Tommy John prevention out there, but we're not doing a lot for the, for the shoulders, for swimmers. Um, for my hip colleagues, so hip pathology um, is also, uh, there are some gender differences uh, on the sports realm. Uh, we know that women undergoing hip arthroscopy have poor outcomes than men if they're over the age of 45. Um, there are hip anatomical differences. So women tend to have smaller uh, alpha angles. The cam lesion tends to be a bit more subtle and they also have an increased capsular volume. So more of their pathology as opposed to being that tight, um, femoral acetabular impingement, more of them will have a hypermobility issue, and that leads to a poor outcome with surgery. So somewhat similar to the shoulder in that. So even though the rate of hip arthroscopy now is fairly even between men and women, but there's a much higher number of women that have a failed initial hip arthroscopy. So 70% of the people in the United States having revision hip arthroscopy are actually women. So that is concerning and something to counsel patients on prior to having surgery. Ankle instability is also more common in women. Um, and women, when they do require surgery, when they become recurrent and they need a Broston procedure, they're much more likely to have a failure of their surgical intervention. So just uh, something to consider that the outcomes aren't quite as good. 
So catastrophic injuries. So, so we're not going to forget our cheerleaders today. They are considered division one athletes at a, at a lot of schools. Um, and so when you're covering a game, you need to always think about this, that the, the cheerleaders are actually your most likely to have a catastrophic injury. So they account for 50% of all catastrophic injuries, which catastrophic, they mean by brain trauma or spine injury. So, and it's because they do these stunting maneuvers where they throw people 20 feet in the air. Um, but it's something to think about when you're covering. So on a more medical side, I'm just going to touch on you know, iron deficiency, uh, more common in women due to the menstrual cycle. Um, it's been shown that restoring those iron stores is, is helpful to women and helps them uh, perform better. Athletic amenorrhea present in up to 20% of vigorously exercising women and about 50% of elite runners and professional ballet dancers uh, suffer from this. It was initially thought to be due to insufficient amount of body fat in these patients, but now it's it's thought to be a caloric mismatch. So there's too little calories being consumed for the output that they're putting on their bodies. And uh, amenorrheic athletes tend to be 25% below normal on their caloric consumption. Um, it can be from an eating disorder like anorexia and bulimia, but that's, that's a little more infrequent. The problem with this is that when their amenorrheic bone loss is seen after about six months, um, they can resemble a postmenopausal woman. And as we know, 60 to 70% of your peak bone mass is reached before the age of 20. So when these women are, are and young girls are amenorrheic at a young age, it's an issue. We're setting them up for a lifetime of, of bone problems. So restoration of a normal menstrual cycle can help retard the bone loss, but it cannot replace what's already been lost. So it's an issue. Uh, the female athlete triad was a term coined in 1991 to describe menstrual irregularity, disordered eating, and premature osteoporosis. It was revised in 2007 by the American College of Sports Medicine to focus more on that metabolic features of the syndrome. So again, there's low energy availability with or without disordered eating. Um, menstrual dysfunction, low bone mineral density, and all three components do not need to be present to consider it female athlete triad. To look for this in your patients, again, you're going to see a higher percentage of non-competitive athletes, the aesthetic athletes, so, or the judged athletes. So people like gymnasts or, or figure skaters who are given a score are much more likely to suffer from this um, and to have some type of disordered eating. And um, What's interesting is that when you look at competitive athletes, female athletes in other sports, it was actually protective against uh, eating disorders. So if you look at you know, a soccer team or a basketball team, they're, they're, more likely, or they're more likely than not to have those problems due to the general population. Concussion is also uh, an issue, and as more as uh, more of them are being recognized and data is being done, we know that the incidence is higher in women. It's a little confusing. They don't know if that's a reporting issue, uh, and there's a lot of theories on that. Um, they know that women have an increased symptom severity over time. There's a longer duration to recovery. Uh, female athletes have twice the concussion risk compared to men, and girls' soccer is really the second second only to football. So if you look at all sports combined, men and women, girls soccer is number two on the board after football. So something to think about. Um, female athletes report more symptoms after the concussion and they generally have the inferior results, particularly when looking at their visual memory compared to the men. And um, the overall women are, take about six days longer to initiate their return to play progression compared to males. So it's affecting, whether, whether it's a um, a bias in the reporting, we're not sure, but uh, it does tend to affect women uh, athletes more, and those results are, um, are not understood clearly. So other issues with women, um, exercise during pregnancy is actually now quite encouraged. Um, regular exercise, preferable to intermittent activity, so particularly women that have been active exercisers until they get pregnant, it's, it's continued to be encouraged as they go through their pregnancy. Um, there's just a few things uh, to counsel patients on. Again, avoiding exercise in the supine position after the first trimester to decrease pressure to the vena cava. Um, stop when fatigued. Uh, they don't need to go to full exertion. And uh, obviously avoiding contact sports isn't good for the baby. <laughs> um, they need to increase their caloric intake accordingly. 
and also keep the core body temperature somewhat low. And then postpartum women are encouraged to resume their activities gradually over a six week period. Um, exercise and aging is an interest really that I have. I think as I get older, I, I think about it a lot because um, what I find fascinating is we take care of patients. You look, you look at these older, um, when you, when you see, you know, I, you know, I saw a patient Monday that was 76, but he looked like he was 50, you know, but he exercised vigorously. And I think we all see that in our patient population. Exercise is clearly one of the keys to staying fit and healthy as we get older and aging well. So I think this is important and particularly with women. Um, just a few words of caution. Uh, we want to beware starting high impact activity after menopause uh, for the risk of stress fractures. But starting young and staying active is the key. So as I think encouraging patients um, to be as fit and active as possible is part of our job, particularly in sports. Um, we know that weightlifting and, and um, increasing some bone uh, loading activity can actually help retard bone loss. So that should be light weightlifting, resistance training should be encouraged. And then uh, balance as people age is also extremely important. So I counsel my elderly patients about you know, doing yoga, doing Tai Chi, all these things have been shown to help prevent falls in the elderly, which we know can be devastating once they start fracturing their bones. So in summary, discussing the female athlete, women tend to get the same injuries as men, but just having an awareness of which ones are uh, more common is important for both prevention and diagnosis. And now I'm gonna focus a little bit on, the, on our vision dream for the Center for Female Athletes at UCSF. So this is uh, really the genesis of uh, my super girl dad boss, Dr. Brian Feely, who, um, as many of you know, has two daughters and uh, has been an active participant in coaching them and encouraging them. And uh, he's an athlete himself, but he's encouraging his young girls to follow suit. And um, just a little bit about our faculty. I'm going to touch on our members. I had a lot of fun doing this part of the talk because I learned a lot about my partners, but with the hire of Dr. Wong, we currently have the largest number of female sports medicine faculty in the United States in our department. So 46% of our sports faculty are women. Uh, we also have the highest percentage uh, in the country, which is pretty exciting. And this is a, a picture I took a few years ago. We were recreating the New Yorker article um, where they put, where they were talking about the rise of female surgeons. And so that's me at the bottom. There's Dr. Wong, which he's a chief and uh, Dr. Moore over there on the right, I think, and then we had a medical student with us, so it was a fun day. Um, and of course, we're, we're losing our chief female athlete here, so I just wanted to touch on how great Christy's been as a mentor uh, with me. We've worked together and known each other at Cal for a long time. She's obviously um, an amazing athlete herself. She played soccer at Duke, as many of you know, and she has uh, sustained multiple injuries as a result of her time. So she not only understands it from uh, an athlete perspective, but also as a patient herself. We have Dr. Center, who is a three-sport high school athlete and a four-year collegiate rower at Harvard. Um, and she currently uh, enjoys hiking uh, with her family. And um, Dr. Chang, who also was a three-sport athlete in high school, um, she wanted to note that she was 12th in the state in discus <laughs> in the state of Ohio. Um, she also sustained an ACL while playing club volleyball at Ohio State. And she's currently an active uh, beach volleyball player, uh, plays golf and likes to cycle. I think our most decorated athlete and who I learned a lot about was Dr. Wingfield. Dr. Wingfield is amazing. She was a lead gymnast from a young age in Canada and uh, was on the Canadian national team from ages 12 to 17. She was sidelined by navicular stress fracture, but she transitioned. I, I love your resilience, Kristen. I, mean, I hope you're listening somewhere, but I, I think it was great. She, she then switched over to springboard diving and uh, was elite enough to compete at the Olympic trials in 1992. She was expected to be an Olympic gymnast, by the way, just FYI. So she went on to the Olympic trials in 1992 for Canada and then once she was done with that, uh, moved to uh, Montreal, where she joined the Cirque du Soleil cast and then performed with Mystere for over 10 years and moved, moved with them to Vegas. So she did this while she was going to medical school and residency, which I found great. 
And now per her email to me, her body is destroyed <laughs> from doing all these things, but she likes rock climbing, golf and running still. So, but I love those pictures. I probably watched you at Miss Deer years ago. <laughs> Um, Dr. LaRoque also learned some great things about her. So again, a three sport athlete in high school in Santa Cruz, um, competed in track, soccer and cross country. And uh, then throughout college was a competitive water skier. And actually you can see her stunting over there on the pyramid. And now she's an avid fisherwoman and that's the largest salmon I've ever seen that she caught in, in Alaska and also enjoys scuba and hiking. <laughs> Dr. Wong, growing up. Uh, for you, my son, delicious and nutritious grapefruit. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? I can't what? cut it. Look, look. I think someone's having breakfast. <laughs> someone's feeding their child breakfast. I love it. My kids are going to bust in here any minute, so no, no worries on that. Uh, she then competed in club water polo in college. And then uh, now is an avid uh, hit boot camp trainer. So she, we'll probably find her at Barry's when it opens. And she enjoys hiking, skiing, and swimming. And then there's myself. I was a very active uh, and a competitive high jumper and uh, track athlete. And uh, in Illinois, I was also a cheerleader. So I put that picture in for Brian Feely to make fun of me for the rest of my career on all the Aquanet that we put in our hair. <laughs> but um, I was uh, um, second in the state of Illinois. I was planning on jumping for the University of Illinois, but then I was sidelined with a pelvic fracture and spine fracture a week before my high school graduation. So that did not happen, but that stimulated my orthopedic career, which was great. And then in my 20s, I got my triathlon phase. And then now, these were just taken a few weeks ago. I I'm, I'm really love mountain biking. I'm biking there with my daughter and hiking the Dipsy Trail with some of my friends the other day. So that's what I enjoy. Our collective experience as a group, um, with all of us, uh, and a lot of these, um, you know, we, we've taken care of as a team, you know, Dr. Chang was the head doctor for the Olympics. Uh, she also just ran the WNBA. Uh, we have experience taking care of NFL, PGA, NBA, NHL, MLS, uh, the Ladies Professional Golf Association, as well as Major League Baseball, um, U.S. soccer we've been involved with, uh, San Francisco Ballet, the Oakland Ballet, Joffrey Ballet of Chicago. Um, from a collegiate perspective, we have uh, coverage experience from Cal, Northwestern, Santa Clara University, University of San Francisco, Academy of Art, Dominican University, and also covering many NC2A special events. Um, currently, I'm helping with the Junior College, City College of San Francisco, and then multiple high school club and rec teams. So we have a tremendous breadth of experience amongst us as, as a group. And I think with this collective experience, you know, as physicians, um, athletes, and uh, many of us as well, being orthopedic patients, we have a unique opportunity to position ourselves as the leading women's sports medicine center in the United States. So it's a pretty great, uh, talented group of women that we have here. And um, I think that we have this potential to, to build this center. So the goals of the center really are gonna be three pronged here. So one, from a clinical perspective, is to focus on multi-specialty integrative approach to the female athlete. And ideally we would offer a team of physicians, nutritionists, exercise physiologists, and a physical therapist and sports psychologist to help evaluate these athletes. Um, ideally we would develop algorithms that would trigger referrals within UCSF. So whether that's to bone health and endocrine, possible ob gyne referrals, um, to our sports performance center at UCSF. We can help feed patients into the center by, by doing that. Ideally, we would also have um, the kind of uh, ability to start and finish an appointment in one day. So a patient could come in, have an experience that would involve them seeing all these realms that need to be uh, identified and getting um, a full evaluation by our team. Our second goal really is to focus on research. Uh, it's interesting when putting this talk together, you see how little research is out there on women athletes. ACL has been looked at a lot, but the rest of the sports, there's a lot of neglect in that. Um, and there's a huge disparity in, in what we know. So we can really um, 
I see that as an opportunity for us to build and, and really help focus on, on these female athletes. We know that there's this complex interplay between the anatomy, the biomechanical issues, the hormones, as well as psychological factors that, that make treating women athletes different than men. And so, and it's still really poorly understood. So again, uh, a lot of potential for growth there. And again, hopefully by getting a better understanding of the epidemiology in these different injuries, we can help counsel women and help them compete at the highest level. And again, um, we can focus again on epidemiology prevention, focus on the biology and bi biomechanics of soft tissue and ligament injury. Also, really the third goal of the center is to provide education uh, to our community as well as community outreach. So that can be done again with local um, marketing, um, getting involved in the schools. I think there's a huge potential again for this aging and wellness field. That's such a hot field and I, I see it because I see women I know are asking and, and um, going out there and trying to really um, uh, continue to exercise and be fit as they get older. And so I think we have a lot of potential um, from that side as well. So overall, you know, our goals are to create a team of female athletes, or I'm sorry, a team of our doctors taking care of female athletes of all ages, from the rec athlete to elite, to empower these athletes to achieve their success. So thank you, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Those are my athletes right there, my children. <laughs> My children, I, as I was doing this talk, I realized, uh, you know, my, my kids are four sport athletes, which is probably a problem. <laughs> there are too many things. Skiing being one of them, ski team. Uh, Sarah, this is Cindy. Thank you very much for that presentation. I think it was um, great to highlight um, some of our other colleagues. And I do want to mention that our three sports medicine fellows are um, all female this year. Our one primary care sports medicine, our two ortho sports medicine fellows. Sir, this is Jeff Lotz. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. I have a quick question. Uh, sure. Are you envisioning, I mean, initially that the, the research you were discussing would be uh, focused on um, you know, customizing or evaluating patients for the purpose of treatment, or are you thinking more looking at the kind of the mechanisms or more basic aspects of injuries through uh, either clinical or preclinical studies? You know, I think it's wide open. That's a, that's a great comment because there's so many as i was just writing the talk I, I wrote down probably 10 ideas i had on what we could do um i think from a you know we as a department we just were able to acquire this uh pearl diver research database and so i think within that we can get some epidemiology studies going um i personally would like to look at, at prevention strategies for injuries so and if they're effective those take a longer time and a lot of manpower but um I think it's useful. You know, I have the time. I'm not going anywhere. So, <laughs> um, thank you. I don't do a lot of basic science research. So, I'm going to let Brian Feely do that and Stephanie <laughs> and Drew <laughs> with their lab. But, but it is interesting. There's a lot of, um, I think the data on the, on the collagen synthesis is really interesting that in women, they don't see that bounce. So, so that makes sense that they might fatigue out earlier and be more prone to injury when they're training the same way that men are. Thank you. Sarah, uh, Tad Vale here. Hi, Tad. Just a uh, great presentation, great overview and vision, and uh, really appreciate uh, having you with us. So it's uh, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, sort of extending on what Jeff was saying, uh, as you're aware, um, there is interest in our basic science labs in bone remodeling, in osteoporosis. Um, the uh, perilacunar remodeling that Tamara Alliston loves so much, and I don't know if Ta Tamara's on the call or not, but there's certainly some connections that would uh, augment uh, and enhance your clinical vision with the, the basic science vision and, and really round out uh, the strength of the, of the future here. It's uh, very exciting. Um, one quick question for you. You, you mentioned the reoperation rate for women with hip arthroscopy, but I didn't catch why. Is, do you know why? Why, why is that reoperation rate higher? What diagnosis is it that's 
the vexing problem. I I think my personal opinion on that, and again, I don't I don't do hip arthroscopy anymore, but my personal opinion is that it's the capsular volume issue and potentially instability of the hip, that micro instability of the hip that is being missed. And as you know, you know, now there's a push to really address the capsule, but for years there wasn't. I think people would leave it wide open. And so I think my personal opinion, and maybe Alan Zhang can chip in if he's listening, or Stephanie, who do more hips, but is that there's probably some issues with that micro instability. Um, and, I, and I'm sure you've seen it as well. You know, a lot of the women that have labral pathology in their hip also have a lot of hyperflexibility, um, where the men tend to be extremely tight. You know, you'll, you'll examine a, man, a man's hip and it's, you know, they've severely limited range of motion where the women that have a labral tear have this excessive hyperflexibility. So I think it's that underlying hyperflexibility that's still an issue. That's my personal opinion, but I, they weren't sure in the <clears> paper. <throat> they just noted that, that it, they saw this higher rate of revision in women. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Sarah, on that issue. I think the higher revision rate is from um, more of the classic data and women do have uh, looser hip joints and thinner capsules. So initially when we we're doing hip arthroscopy, uh, we weren't very um, attentive to the hip capsule. So uh, a lot of uh, patients, especially female patients, would have micro instability, um, which can cause pain. Uh, and then they would uh, start to go back to do revisions, usually for those patients to tighten up the capsule and repair the capsule. So now that we're more mindful about how we manage the capsule and regularly closing it on patients that may be susceptible to it, the uh, outcomes have been a lot better. We just published uh, our series here from UCSF looking at our um, outcomes based on gender and, and they were similar between women and men with a good improvement at two years in our series. Hi, Sarah, this is Einar Sawyer and uh, I'm really happy to have you here and also really enjoyed your talk and the center sounds very exciting. I'd love to talk to you about the skeletal health service and how we could support what you're doing and uh, I see a lot of female athlete stress fractures there. So really looking forward to connecting with you. Thanks so much for this talk. Thank you. I'm looking forward to meeting you. I've heard nice things. Thank you. Any yeah. other uh, comments or questions for Dr. Edwards? Yeah, I, I'll just say our goal as we as we get started here is to really make connections. And I know um, Car Carlin, you know, probably has the most experience here at UCSF and, and has already suggested many um, people within UCSF we need to connect with. So we'll be working on that. That's one of our goals to align a team of people that are interested. Um, and particularly from the research perspective as well, I'm open to collaborating with anyone who has an interest in this. So. Great job, uh, Sarah. It's Anthony uh, with the Human Form Center. And, uh, you know, we're, as you know, we're trying to get all, all the ACL prevention kind of program running as a clinical service. So, you know, really look forward to working with you guys. And that'd be a potential avenue for research for sure. We're all on board with that. Yes, definitely. No, we, that's, that's really, I think, kind of the flashy side of what you can offer is having the performance um, as part of it which uh, we definitely want to team with what you've already built, Anthony. So, and funnel more patients to, to that center. <laughs> It'd be good. Great. Um, well, Sarah, thanks so much for presenting. I think it, um, you know, it's definitely an exciting vision and um, look forward to collaborating and making it happen. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me today. And thank you all for joining and um, we'll see you next week for our first um, visiting professor of the year. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.